The problem, John, is that it is often when uh, regimes like the Chinese regime feel weak and insecure that they take uh, geopolitical risk. Neil Ferguson is the Milbank Family Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University in California. He was previously a professor of history at Harvard, at New York University, and Oxford. He's written many best selling books about history and economics. His insights on politics and society at large are widely sought after. His latest book is Doom The Politics of Catastrophe, and we'll be touching on that. Uh, but this is a far reaching conversation about the global outlook for peace, for want of a better, simple term. I hope you enjoy it. Well, Neil, thank you so much for joining us again. Uh, you're very much an appreciated guest from time to time on these uh, video podcast series. And I take you back to a little over two years ago. You were in Sydney. You and I had a recorded conversation uh, in front of uh, a live audience in the old state parliament in New South Wales. And one of the comments you made was that looking at Australia's position, uh, an isolated uh, uh, democracy uh, sitting on very valuable real estate, apparently largely disengaged from the emerging dangers, and you made the plea, you must prepare, 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 in, in reality, of the great dangers that confronted us. Um, and I wanted to talk to you today to gauge your feelings. I mean, it's only a matter of weeks since we had the a chaotic withdrawal, uh, messy and I would have thought unnecessary withdrawal from Afghanistan that sent all sorts of messages about the declinism of the West, America in particular. Now in Australia, we've all been stunned by the pulling together by our Prime Minister of, uh, very hard to say it almost, the AUKUS Alliance Partnership uh, in which America has agreed to share with us uh, it's nuclear submarine technology, amongst other things. Now, there are many issues that arise, but I'd love to get your impressions. It's a big contrast. Is there a real chance that there's life left in, if you like, the West's commitment to defending its freedoms, its values and its freedoms? Well, Henry Kissinger once said that uh, US foreign policy was uh, something that, that foreigners believed existed as a coherent strategy, but in reality, it was the accidental byproduct of interagency rivals within the city of, of Washington, DC. And I think the recent performance of the Biden administration bears that out. Uh, you've got to remember that the president himself uh, is an old man, uh, his ability to sustain uh, the workload of uh, the most powerful man in the world is at least open to question. Uh, much of the uh, the day-to-day decision-making uh, is going on further down the chain of command. The National Security Advisor, Jake Sullivan, uh, is someone with uh, experience of academia and Washington staff jobs. Uh, he is a relatively uh, young man for such an important job. And I think it's fair to say that the Pentagon uh, was doing one thing with respect to Afghanistan and the State Department was doing another. And that's a, that's a simplification. Uh, the withdrawal from Afghanistan was, of course, a long time coming. Uh, Barack Obama had wanted to do it and had been overruled by the military. Donald Trump said he was going to do it, did a deal with the Taliban, a pretty bad deal, uh, but it was left to Joe Biden to execute. And I think it's fair to say they executed it badly. And they executed it badly mainly because the message went to the military, get everybody out by the president's deadline. That's your mission. And the military said, yes, sir. And they executed the mission. Nobody really seems to have thought through where that would leave not only American civilians, but all the different people in Afghanistan who had been involved in helping the US and its allies uh, over 20 years. And the result was the total fiasco. Avoidable, as I think you said, uh, unnecessary in my view, because I don't think it was beyond the bounds uh, 
uh, of possibility to maintain a relatively small force in Afghanistan and prevent the Taliban from taking over the country. But the net result is that after 20 years of massive effort, uh, huge expenditure, uh, the United States has been defeated along with its uh, its allies, and the Taliban have won. So that's part A of the of the story. And part B is a completely different thing that is unrelated to that, no matter what anybody tells you. It's essentially unrelated. The people working on China on the National Security Council, people like Kurt Campbell and Rush Doshi, have been quietly working away at a strategy of containment of China, which is essentially diplomatic and military in nature, but is predicated on the idea that you need alliances, new alliances, uh, to contain China. One of these, which had already been discussed, was the Quad with, uh, of course, Japan, India, as well as Australia. Uh, but AUKUS, or as it was briefly known, OSAC, you could see why they dropped that, uh, was a surprise uh, that they successfully uh, uh, sprang on everybody. And uh, you're right, it's an altogether better look than the look of abandoning Kabul to the Taliban. But I don't think these things are related. I think they illustrate the lack of any coherent uh, strategy and the fact that the administration is essentially pursuing contradictory uh, policies in different parts of the world. Uh, a lack of a coherent strategy. Would it be fair to say that in a surprising way, the Prime Minister of Australia um, you know, pulled together some strategy, pulled together a coherent argument, had an enormous, punched above his weight, as you might say. Uh, I'm, I'm genuinely looking for your reaction to this. I mean, it came as a great surprise in Australia uh, because there's been rising concern about China and utter dismay uh, at the timetable and also the capabilities of the proposed submarines that we'd ordered from the French. Deep dismay. They'd become a byword in Australia. There's no other way of putting it for our own incompetence and our feeling we couldn't get our act together. Whether that was fair or not, that, that's the way it was perceived. But all of a sudden, our Prime Minister really looked like he had managed to inject serious intellectual clout and thought and leadership into a worrying international situation. Am I overplaying that? No, I think Scott Morrison deserves a good deal of the credit for uh, driving this. And of course, also taking uh, the decision uh, to alienate uh, the French uh, president, Emmanuel Macron, which has been the cost of uh, this decision. Uh, Boris Johnson also played a part. Uh, he's not famous for his uh, strategic vision and uh, long-term planning, but uh, between them, I think they, they did a lot of the lifting. Uh, but as I said, the US, uh, National Security Council has been moving in this direction for some time. And so they were pushing on an open door. It's a pity Joe Biden couldn't remember Scott Morrison's name when he was announcing uh, AUKUS, but that illustrates the point I made earlier about the president's waning powers. Uh, but you're right, I think, to give Scott Morrison credit for this. And I think it's important to, to recognize that since you and I last met in, uh, in Sydney, there has been a significant uh, shift. Back then, I think it was becoming apparent to more and more Australians that Cold War II was underway and uh, any notion of a harmonious relationship with China was fading. Uh, since then, it's only got worse. Uh, not only has China lent extremely hard on Australia uh, economically, uh, but Australia, as much as any other country, has been impacted by a pandemic that had its origin in China and, and occurred because, without a doubt, negligence happened not only in Wuhan, not only at the provincial level, but also at the national level. This, this was an avoidable pandemic. Had the Chinese authorities been honest, uh, in December of 2019 about what was happening and not attempted to deny that they had a new pathogen with human to human transmission, we might not be still grappling as you are in Australia with lockdowns and all the other uh, all the other disruption that the pandemics brought about. So things have moved a long way since you and I last spoke and the rest of the world now sees what was becoming obvious to Australians 
two or more years ago that we are in something like a Cold War. And, and it's good to know that the administration in Washington gets that too, even if they don't like calling it a Cold War. You'll perhaps have noticed that Joe Biden last week in New York explicitly disavowed the notion that we're in a new Cold War. But that just means we are in one, but we don't want to call it by that name for fear of uh, inflaming uh, the relations with China any anymore. But we're clearly in a new strategic landscape. And it's good that we're taking concrete steps, both diplomatic and military steps, to try to have a solution to the problem posed by Xi Jinping and the Chinese Communist Party. And that problem is uh, that they appear to be on some kind of war path uh, with increasingly uh, aggressive tactics, uh, not just in constructing uh, military and naval bases in the South China Sea, but in threatening Taiwan and, and saying again and again that the ultimate objective of Xi Jinping is to bring Taiwan under the control of Beijing, of the Chinese Communist Party. Th this is a dangerous road that China's going down. And the best way to prevent this leading to conflict is to create some kind of deterrence. Deterrence needs to have a diplomatic and a military dimension to it. And showing China that it is increasingly isolated, that in the region and globally, the United States has allies and has a strategy is extremely important. It's a way, I think, of discouraging Xi Jinping from doing something which would be enormously risky and destabilizing, namely trying to change the status quo by taking control of, of Taiwan. That, that has the potential to create an enormous geopolitical crisis. And I think the real significance of AUKUS along with the court, is that they are steps to deter China from, from taking that reckless step. Yeah, the, uh, the amazingly prescient Lee Kuan Yew from uh, Singapore, you know, one of the cleverest statesmen I suspect of the last century, warned some 20 years ago that this sort of approach would become necessary. It was extraordinary how far he could see into the future and how well he understood it. And I must say, it seems to me that, that sort of group or allying together of of people who have everything to lose, even if they're not so much in sync with one another's thinking, but everything to lose by China becoming dominant in the region and ultimately globally is a big part of the answer. Before we come back to China, because I'd really like to explore this, I know how well you understand that country. A couple of other things. One, one point on the way through, it's easy to despair of leadership in the West today uh, and uh, you know, the, the, the sort of uh, impact of fragmentation, polarisation, what have you. There's a really interesting set of numbers though, around Australian attitudes towards nuclear submarines in the heart of this. Six months ago in March, a reputable poll uh, found that uh, something like 35 to 38% of Australians favoured switching submarines and finding nuclear power. Remember, Australia's the only country in the world that has an actual prohibition on nuclear energy. And the Prime Minister has been saying that doesn't mean we'll have a nuclear energy uh, industry in Australia and we won't have nuclear uh, weapons either. Just the submarines are now sealed for life, you know, all the rest of it. Um, uh, but the, uh, what the, the point I wanted to make is a really interesting one. You've got a, there's been a doubling of support for the ideas of, of, of obtaining these things. And even the green voters in this country are surprisingly... Um, supportive. I wouldn't say there's a majority, but there's close to it. Uh, in rural Australia, it's it's up in the 90s. The point, Neil, is an interesting one. Uh, it's not just that the perception of China as a dangerous place has suddenly exploded in the last six months. It was all very already very high. It's clear cut through leadership that says we have a problem, we're going to deal with it, does still move the electorate. And so many politicians seem to have forgotten that in the West. Leadership matters. That's right, John. Of course, one mustn't uh, over egg the pudding. It's going to take quite a while uh, for this new submarine capability to be ready. Uh, and that's why other aspects of the deal are in many ways uh, more important in the short run. Uh, and I think we're also seeing here uh, a growth uh, from intelligence cooperation into something much more uh, military and, and naval uh, in its character. We're, we're moving from Five Eyes to something new. Uh, it seems unclear uh, if New Zealand is going to be part of that. Uh, probably not. 
Uh, but I think it's an interesting illustration that there is something uh, to Britain's post-Brexit uh, vision. Uh, the, the phrase global Britain was used a lot by the proponents of Brexit. It didn't really mean terribly much until now. And now it become, becomes clear that there is some substance to that. And it wasn't just a publicity stunt to send a British aircraft carrier all the way uh, to uh, the Indo-Pacific region. So I think this is important, not just for Australia, I think it's important for, for Britain too. And as I said, I think it's it's an important way in which the Biden administration is going beyond what Trump had done. Trump had, to give him his due, focused American minds on the Chinese threat and had created a complete shift in attitudes, not only amongst voters, but I think at the level of the policy elites. And as a result, the US moved steadily under Trump's uh, leadership from tariffs to something much more uh, like uh, a policy of containment. But Trump was never terribly good with allies. Uh, it was something that his America first strategy didn't really include. And he had to be frequently uh, topped off the ledge uh, when he began threatening uh, allies with uh, tariffs, uh, not to mention asking people like the South Koreans to pay for the privilege of having U.S. troops. So I think in an important way, the Biden administration recognizes that you can't have a successful Cold War strategy without allies. And uh, although I think Kabul, the fall of Kabul, did immense damage to American relations with its allies, AUKUS at least has done something to steady the ship and show that there is some substance uh, to the talk of, uh, of a more diplomatically uh, adroit American strategy. I want to go straight to that point because the flip side of the leadership that I think the Prime Minister and Australia has shown uh, on, on this new alliance is the one that you just alluded to. Given that there's been an enormous focus on its central part and indeed the thing that drove it in the first place, submarines, we're now faced with the reality that it's dawning on us that it'll be even longer on current timelines before we obtain the first one than it would have been with the French ones. It may be 2040. Goodness only knows what might have happened by then. And so you've had all sorts of activity uh, in the public debate about, um, well, should we try and lease some? Should we try and do this or do that, embed Australian crews on American boats, whatever it happens to be? This is going to be the big test. Will the thing in this country in particular succeed? Will it deliver? Will it be durable? One of the questions that arises out of that is that my understanding is that despite declining defence spending, particularly as a proportion of GDP in America, your boatyards, or not your, but the American boatyards are, are chock-a-block at building Virginia classes as quickly as they can. I don't know how the Brits are going with the suits. There's no place for us in the production line. And people are pointing out, well, there's not much point in Australia having some nuclear submarines, if it just means the Americans and the Brits have got less, you need to expand what the alliance has available to it. And one of the issues then becomes, I suppose, an engineering, technical, logistical one. But is it going to be possible for somebody to actually crank up production? And then domestically for us, will we accept that you shouldn't confuse industry and defence policy? Uh, it may be not realistic to try and build at least the first handful of them here at all. And so there's a lot of issues there that go to the durability, the credibility, the way in which this deal will be seen by friends and foes alike. So that that leadership I talked about will need a lot of follow through and it's going to require a lot of goodwill, frankly, amongst all partners. Uh, I hope that there is a lot of goodwill in Britain towards Australia. I think there is in America. Uh, your friend and colleague at Harvard, uh, Victor Davis Hanson, tells me that research consistently shows a great fondness on the part of the Americans for Australians in an environment when Austra Americans are reluctant. I understand this too, to get involved in troubles abroad. That friendship bond seems to me to be very important. Well, I, I think it's important not to fixate on the submarines, uh, partly because of the yeah. long timeline, but also because the nature of, of war is changing. Any conflict uh, between the United States and China, say, over Taiwan, uh, will not be a 20th century style 
uh, naval battle. Uh, it will be as much uh, fought in the air and in space as under the water and on the surface of, of the sea. And it will also be a war waged in cyberspace. Uh, and I sometimes think that uh, many commentators on these issues underestimate the extent to which the war of the future will be uh, will be a cyber war. And I worry a little bit that we underestimate our vulnerability uh, in that area. So I think the key point about AUKUS is the, the range of different things uh, that we're really talking about. It, it is not just about yes. the subs. Uh, and I think it is it's all about building uh, the kind of uh, technology sharing capability that will improve uh, Australia's uh, as well as uh, uh, the UK's resilience in the event of uh, a, a new kind of warfare that extends far beyond the familiar conventional domain. You also need to remember, if you read Jim Stavridis' uh, new novel, 2034, that a war between the US and China would have the potential to go nuclear. Indeed, in his uh, imaginary conflict set in the 2030s, it does uh, go nuclear. And so we, we need to be careful here not to assume things about uh, the conflict that lies ahead. There's a nightmare scenario in which we, we find ourselves unwittingly on the road to World War III. Uh, that is something that is not unimaginable if the US and China went to full-scale war uh, over the status of Taiwan. There is also a scenario in which we don't go all the way to war, and we have something more like the Cuban Missile Crisis uh, over Taiwan. But there's a third scenario um, in which uh, the United States actually folds because it can't, in fact, prevent China from taking control of Taiwan without suffering military defeat, defeat at sea. Remember, those aircraft carriers that the US could send in the past to deter China no longer are that effective a deterrent because they can be sunk by China's land-based uh, missiles. There is an arms race going on in the world, which is technological, which you don't capture if you just look at budgets in relation to GDP. The advent of hypersonic missiles changes the nature uh, of warfare too. So I, I do think it's important to set AUKUS in perspective. We're in the midst of a huge shift uh, in the nature of the geopolitical order. It's becoming clearer and clearer that we are in something like Cold War II, but we're also in a Cold War with different technologies from Cold War I. And these different technologies mean that the next war could be a very different kind of war from the ones that we're accustomed to. And we might look back and say, you know, they made a great fuss about those submarines, but that really wasn't the important part of AUKUS. What was really important related uh, to, to the cyber domain, to the intelligence cooperation, to technological sharing, which is in fact much broader than, than simply the, the sharing of nuclear submarine technology. I will do, tease that out a little. Um, again, the research in Australia is very interesting. Uh, Australians, I think, perceive that we're already in some sort of grey war in terms of cyber conflict. And they worry about identity theft, about credit card theft, but also about you know, state secrets, about the raiding of big business and uh, our technological capacities and what have you, rightly. But if the old saying's right, uh, uh, you know, offence is the best form of defence, it's interesting to note that people respond by saying we need better protection, we need better uh, cyber protection, uh, identity theft protection, whatever it happens to be. What does uh, an offensive against this sort of behaviour by uh, people like the Chinese and, and the Russians actually look like? We're not talking about how you actually respond with fire. We're only talking about how we somehow firewall ourselves. Any thoughts in that area? Well, the great vulnerabilities uh, for China right now are, in fact, economic. Uh, they are heavily reliant on, for example, imported uh, semiconductors, which they can't make for themselves at the highest level of sophistication. Uh, they're heavily reliant on imported uh, fossil fuel energy, not least uh, coal. Uh, China's, in fact, heavily uh, reliant also on its access to international capital markets. And so in the event of a conflict, I think the great vulnerabilities uh, for China would in, in fact be economic. And I'm fairly confident that the US war plan in that scenario would essentially be a version of the old 1914-18 blockade that uh, uh, the Royal Navy imposed on, on Germany. 
uh, because I think uh, th this would really quite quickly bring uh, China to its knees. Uh, this is important, though, because there's there's a financial dimension to this that that impacts everybody. If there's a U.S.-China conflict, you can be sure that global financial markets sell off in a way we haven't seen since perhaps 2008, the time of the Lehman bankruptcy. This would be a huge risk-off moment. Uh, and I think the question that, that is difficult is, well, who would take that pain better, Beijing or Washington? Uh, by and large, US uh, governments don't like financial pain that backfires on the United States. And I think part of the problem with the way the US is approaching China is that it would ultimately use financial weapons uh, against China, financial sanctions, uh, but that, that would hurt the United States. And this is what makes Cold War II different from Cold War I in a very important way. The US and the Soviet Union never had much in the way of economic ties. The US and China are heavily intertwined economically, even after Trump's trade war. Capital flows are still at a large scale. Foreign investors, including US investors, have poured money into China over the last 18 months. And, and so one of the little puzzles in my mind about Cold War II is what happens in the event of an escalation over Taiwan uh, when financial markets crater? Does the Biden administration see it through or do they draw back because they're actually more impacted by a financial market cr crash than, than their Chinese counterparts who don't have to worry about things like elections? Remember, the US is always just a, a short distance away from the next election. Next year, we'll have midterm elections that will decide whether the Democrats uh, still control Congress. Uh, and, and then, of course, once that's over, we'll start thinking about the 2024 presidential election. That There's never a great time for the US to get into a big war. And crucially, and this is very important to understand, that the US is unlikely to get into a big war unless it feels itself to be attacked. That is to say, China needs and this was put to me recently by a very experienced uh, observer of, uh, of US foreign policy, that China needs to kill American servicemen to get a war started. Uh, and China's unlikely to, to do that if it can find other ways of exerting uh, pressure on Taiwan. So I think a plausible scenario that, that I can imagine is, is one in which the Chinese don't do something as, as confrontational as invade Taiwan. They don't do something as confrontational as sink an American aircraft carrier, but rather they use economic, cyber, and other means to undermine Taiwan's autonomy and gamble on the Biden administration not really wanting to risk escalation uh, for domestic political reasons. So this is the way to think about this from an Australian vantage point. Ultimately, you will not decide when things kick off in, the, uh, in Taiwan or the South China Sea. That will be determined by Beijing and Washington. But the critical question in my mind is, does it happen in a way that justifies American action and therefore triggers alliances like AUKUS? Or are the Chinese clever enough uh, to put pressure on Taiwan in a way that doesn't trigger an American military response? It does, Greg. It begs the question a little bit as to what ultimately might be China's greatest priority, the expulsion of the Americans from the Pacific region, so to speak, the winding back of their power or reunification with Taiwan. I would have thought both were objectives, but we probably overlook the importance of limiting American power or pushing America out. It's not just about Taiwan. The top priority of, Ameri of Chinese leadership is to preserve the power of the Communist Party in China. Yeah. That is the number one priority. And the great concern of Xi Jinping and his advisors is that in various ways, that grip on power is threatened. And I yeah. think one should understand most of the things that Xi Jinping has done since he came to power in those terms. Some of it looks inexplicable. You might ask why the crackdown on the big tech companies last year, why are you having a, a, a sudden credit crunch in the real estate market? What exactly uh, motivates the crackdown in, in Hong Kong? What is that all about? I think in each case, the answer is consolidating the dominant position of the Chinese Communist Party and ensuring that any threat to it uh, is snuffed out. Now, Taiwan is significant because in Xi Jinping's mind, his ultimate legacy and the reason he wants to extend his period in office 
beyond the normal two terms uh, is to bring Taiwan into the fold and end its de facto autonomy and democracy. In his mind, that's the ultimate goal. And, and he is in a position to set China's strategic priorities because he is as powerful a leader as China has had since Mao Zedong. Uh, so I think that's really what's going on here. Beyond those key objectives, stabilize and strengthen communist rule and bring Taiwan into the fold, everything else is secondary, uh, including uh, establishing Chinese primacy in the Indo-Pacific region. That would be nice. But I think in the minds of, of Xi Jinping and his advisors, if they can bring Taiwan into the fold, then de facto Chinese primacy is established. And that's certainly how the Japanese think about it, as you doubtless know, John, in their minds, if Taiwan goes, then Japan's uh, strategic situation is significantly worsened. Uh, so I think the key here is that if, if Taiwan can be brought under Beijing's control, then de facto China becomes number one in the Indo-Pacific region and the United States becomes number two. Coming to this issue uh, that you've alluded to and written about a great deal, uh, many of the actions that the Chinese Communist Party are taking, though, appear to me to make their own position less viable. I mean, you know, they've got uh, a very rapid demographic decline. You've got empty cities, as I understand it. Um, you've got this real tension between innovation and entrepreneurship and you see this big move back towards socialism and, um, you know, a so-called equitable society. You've got sky-high uh, private sector debt uh, and truly amazing uh, public sector debt, as I understand it as well, plus now real international um, pushback. So don't those things in some ways suggest that, uh, and I think uh, I'm putting words in your mouth, but this is what you've been saying, that there's nothing inevitable about China's continuing rise at all. That's right, John. I think one of the problems that bedevils Western analysis of China uh, is that we tend to exaggerate uh, the strength of the system. Just as we used to exaggerate the strength of the Soviet Union, uh, we're always taken in very easily uh, by trips to uh, a few flagship cities. Uh, and just as people would go to the Soviet Union in the 1930s and say, I've seen the future and it works. So over the last 20 years, uh, people from the West have made trips to Beijing and Shanghai and Shenzhen, and they've, they've said much the same thing. In reality, China is in very serious difficulties Firstly, for the reason you mentioned, its population is uh, going to shrink. Uh, if you look at the, the worst case scenario of the United Nations population uh, forecasts, it could decline by half between now and the end of the century. It's certainly likely to decline by around 20%. Its workforce is already shrinking. Uh, it is, as has often been said, uh, getting old before it gets rich. On top of that, the business model of the last 20 years has been heavily reliant on uh, not so much bridges to nowhere as apartments for no one, tower blocks that uh, are unlikely ever to be occupied. Uh, and this is a core part and a very large part of Chinese economic activity, as my old friend Ken Rogoff demonstrated in a very impressive paper uh, last year. Uh, only Spain on the eve of the global financial crisis uh, had such a large part of economic activity tied to real estate as China does today. And don't forget the climate problem that the Chinese have. The more the rest of the world agrees that drastic steps have to be taken to reduce uh, fossil fuel uh, consumption and greenhouse gas emissions, the tougher China's position is. Fact. 93% of the increase in coal consumption since Greta Thunberg was born, which was in 2003, is accounted for by China. China is really the bad boy uh, in the climate change debate. And that is going to become more and more obvious. 
which is why Xi Jinping is having to make concessions on constructing coal burning power stations outside China. But of course, the real problem is the ones that they keep building inside China. So the Chinese model uh, was already reaching the limits of what was sustainable. The true, I think, natural growth rate is much closer to two or three percent than, than to six or seven percent. And we're gradually seeing this uh, economic gravity pulling growth down, uh, despite uh, all the efforts of, of the regime uh, to keep the show on the road. So I think that's part of the reason for Xi Jinping's feelings of insecurity. The reason the party worries about its future, and they really worry that they won't even make it to celebrate the centenary of the People's Republic uh, in 2049, is that they know the system, say, under the weight of its own contradictions. And let's not forget the inequality, uh, which is, of course, the reason for all the neo-Maoist talk that we hear for Xi Jinping, from Xi Jinping. If your Gini coefficient is up in Latin American territory, if you have inequality that you, you'd really need to go to Latin America to see, then, of course, there's a problem. Uh, and that is, I think, a big part of the explanation for the increasingly Marxist-Leninist tone of, of Xi Jinping's speeches. None of this seems to me to portend China's inexorable rise, rather the opposite. I think China is in much more trouble over a 20 year time horizon than the United States or its allies. The problem, John, is that it is often when uh, regimes like the Chinese regime feel weak and insecure that they take uh, geopolitical risk uh, because the way out of this uh, predicament, uh, at least in the eyes of some Chinese nationalists, is in fact conflict. Because through nationalism, you can re-legitimize the regime, which otherwise is in danger of losing its legitimacy. And that's the worry for me. It's not China's rise that poses the problem. It's China's weakness and the insecurity of its own, if, of its own ruling Communist Party. Uh, I understand you've written on that extensively, and I profoundly believe that you are right to warn us that, in fact, the... Uh, a wounded bear or a bear aware that it doesn't have uh, quite the lifespan or, and, the, and the power that others think it does can be very tempted to strike out. And that leads immediately to, to their question, to the question of how they perceive the West. And, and you've written about this as well a lot. Uh, you know, the, the Second World War, Churchill described as the unnecessary war. So many signals were sent, self-loathing, self-doubt, the British upper classes, elites and so forth. Uh, the famous Oxford debate, you know, I wouldn't die for king and country. Uh, Churchill saw those as only encouraging a Germany that was in no powerful position in those earlier days to take on the West to think, well, the West won't fight, so we'll push on. Uh, so how is all of uh, this tied? How, what's the, what's the, how do we understand how China sees the, the West and in, in this dangerous state where it may be tempted to have a go out of weakness rather than strength? There's no doubt that the image of the United States uh, in China has uh, been very tarnished, not just by... Uh, the recent past, it's really been going on since the financial crisis, uh, which was a rude awakening for those Chinese who thought that the US was really the, uh, the most impressive uh, show in town. I think even more recently, uh, America's mishandling of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has added to the Chinese sense that the US has passed its sell-by date as a superpower. And then you've got, of course, the cult of wokeism and the uh, the increasingly divided uh, political culture of of the United States, the self hating uh, aspects of uh, of phenomena like critical race theory. The Chinese watch all this and they conclude that the United States uh, is tearing itself apart and therefore highly unlikely to be able uh, to mount an effective defense if there is a Taiwan crisis. And they're not entirely wrong to think this. I, I certainly struggle to see how this administration would persuade the American public that they needed to go to war uh, over Taiwan, an island that very few Americans, I think, could find uh, on a map of the world. So the Chinese sense that the US is, is divided, is weak, it's is past its prime. I don't think this is unjustified. In many ways, 
It's true. If you look at the numbers, as I did in a recent piece for The Economist a, a few weeks ago, actually, the US looks a lot like Britain between the wars, uh, weighed down with debt, uh, with all kinds of uh, domestic preoccupations and a kind of lack of enthusiasm for the role of, of global policemen. I mean, remember, three presidents since George W. Bush have disavowed America's global mission, starting with Barack Obama, followed by Donald Trump and now Joe Biden. Uh, there is a, a kind of variation on a theme here where everybody basically agrees that the war on terror was a huge mistake and the United States should just come on home and focus on its domestic knitting. So when the Chinese look at the United States, they see a country that doesn't look ready for a showdown, uh, certainly not uh, in a faraway country of, of which Americans know relatively little. Uh, so I think part of what's going on here is China's sense of insecurity combines with the perception that the US is not really up for it. And that's encouraging what I think is a rather dangerous uh, tendency in Beijing to consider the possibility of a dramatic move uh, on the international stage to try uh, to cement the legitimacy of Xi Jinping's leadership and the Communist Party's leadership. And that, that's why that, that's why it all kind of matters. It, it matters that China is in all kinds of ways structurally in trouble because that incentivizes Xi Jinping to consider taking risk and playing the nationalist card. It also matters that the United States is going through a kind of late Soviet phase. I mean, you can't help thinking there's something late Soviet about the United States today when the president shows every sign uh, of, of, of creeping senility and that the top military uh, have so many ribbons on their uniforms that they seem to have stumbled out of uh, some kind of Soviet documentary from the 1970s. So I, I don't blame the Chinese for thinking that the US has passed its superpower sell-by date. It's just that people have made this mistake before. The US often looks in its history as if it's uh, in self-destruct mode. It did in the mid-1970s. Remember, all those analogies between the fall of Kabul and the fall of, of Saigon in 1975 People forgot to point out that the fall of Saigon did not exactly presage the decline and fall of the United States, because really within a very short period of time, US, uh, the US was bouncing back under Ronald Reagan and winning the Cold War under George H.W. Bush. So it looks like the US is going through one of its periodic meltdowns, but it's done that before and bounced back. Do you think uh, we were talking about the, the new alliance, uh, Britain, Australia and uh, America, and you also referred to those people carefully thinking in Washington about how to build alliances to counter this uh, and what have you. Would that have caused anything of a reset in Beijing's thinking at all? You know, here are the Brits of all people joining with us in a serious way again the sort of place called Australia that they're pretty contemptuous of, and we brought that on ourselves in a military sense because we haven't taken it seriously. Suddenly we look like we are, but that you know that's a story yet to be fully unfolded. Would there have been any reset at, at the appearance that maybe this alliance approach is beginning to work in their thinking about Western declinism? I think we should watch carefully how things uh, evolve uh, over the coming months uh, looking ahead to the Winter Olympics uh, in Beijing next year. There's a new ambassador uh, in Washington uh, who has an, a distinctly different style from his predecessor. It's not, I think, a, a straight uh, and unbending road to conflict. Uh, and the Chinese uh, uh, leadership elite, uh, for all its flaws, is not stupid. Liu He uh, is one of the key advisors uh, to uh, Xi Jinping. I've known him for many years. He's a highly intelligent man with a very good understanding of the United States. So I think one of the, the reassuring things about the world that I see today is that there is an awareness of, of risk on the Chinese side. And they know that if they were to get this wrong, uh, if they were to risk a premature move on, on Taiwan and lose, it would be game over. And, and that's really an extremely important thing to bear in mind. Just in the, 
in the last few days, we've had some very interesting discussions here at the Hoover Institution about the defense of Taiwan and how exactly we can deter China. Uh, and the uh, analogy of a porcupine is one that I heard mm. used. If you make Taiwan enough of a porcupine, uh, make it difficult enough uh, from the vantage point of Beijing, then you might just succeed in deterring what is a relatively risk averse political elite. China hasn't fought many wars. Uh, really, uh, it hasn't fought a, a war since uh, its, it, its showdown with Vietnam, uh, which is so long ago that I was a teenager. Uh, so it's not as if they have battle hardened troops uh, ready to take on uh, even the Taiwanese, uh, much less the US uh, and its allies. So I, I, I sense that there is a lot to be gained from the kind of diplomatic moves that produced AUKUS in the same way that I think the Quad is a very, very important signal that the US and Japan are closer together than they have ever been. And India, which remember was a thorn in the side of the United States during Cold War I, India is now increasingly seen as, as an ally. Th these are really important signals to Xi Jinping that he's blown it. Because let's face it, he has. You could subtitle Xi Jinping's foreign policy over the last uh, decade as how to lose friends and alienate people. Who exactly are Chinese, China's allies at this point? Uh, let's think North Korea, mm, yes. Uh, <laughs> Venezuela, oh great. Uh, who else have we got? Oh, Russia. Well, if you think Vladimir Putin can be relied upon in, in a crisis over Taiwan, then you know pretty much nothing about Russian history. Although the, uh, the, the Russian Federation and the People's Republic of China are very close right now uh, to the point of joint military exercises, if I was Xi Jinping, I wouldn't trust Vladimir Putin further than I could throw him. Because from Putin's point of view, nothing would be better than for the US and China to fight a big war and inflict significant damage on one another, leaving him uh, sitting on the sidelines with that uh, wintry smile that he likes occasionally to wear. So I, I don't think China has a whole lot of diplomatic uh, options out there. In fact, it looks increasingly isolated. And why not? Think of it. Uh, first, you start a pandemic, a kind of massive version of the Chernobyl disaster. Then you deny that it was your fault. You go on Twitter and try to claim that the Americans brought the virus to Wuhan. Nobody believes you. Then you tell your diplomats, it's time to do wolf warrior diplomacy. You piss everybody off, even the French. I mean, they've done a lot to isolate themselves. We didn't actually have to do that much. Uh, so my sense is that this all makes it harder and harder for Xi Jinping to contemplate uh, a really decisive uh, coup de main uh, against Taiwan. And that's good because we want to deter him. We, we don't want this war to happen. We do not want even a Cuban Missile Crisis to happen because it would be extremely risky and, and, and nerve wracking as the Cuban Missile Crisis was. So yeah, more of the same as my advice to the Biden administration, keep on working on this diplomatic theme. Uh, it's certainly getting through to Beijing. They know that this reduces their room for maneuver quite significantly. Just, uh, that, and that's reassuring, and I, 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 it all makes perfect sense to me. The, the Chinese people themselves, one of the things about repressive regimes is that usually they've uh, sown the seeds of their own collapse uh, in many ways. But what we've never seen before is the extraordinary capacity to uh, eavesdrop on your citizens. You know, 400 million closed circuit televisions, face recognition, point systems for newborns you add to or have subtracted from during your lifetime, which have determined what internet speed you'll have and who you can marry and whether you get a job, presumably. That is extraordinary control. Um, and I just wonder how you think that plays out. You know, the people I know who, who have lived and worked or even still in China today, so you pick up the sort of massive change in the, in the attitude of the Chinese people towards Westerners to the level of uh, women saying, no, we can't gather with you anymore. You're now the enemy, uh, the sort of anecdotal stuff that I hear um, uh, in, a, in a social club or social setting or a sporting setting or whatever. How do we read the Chinese masses who are cut off to a surprising degree, uh, who are surveilled and policed 
in a way that is quite chilling and not a way that any of us would want to live, uh, at the same time as presumably many of them have had a taste of a better way of life and despite the restrictions on their access to the internet and what have you, are aware that uh, the West remains a much better sort of style of uh, place to live in. How does that play out in your view? Well, I think you have to draw a distinction between the educated middle class, which has had some uh, exposure to the Western world and and the, the labouring masses who still remain quite cut off and uh, and for whom uh, the uh, the environment is essentially a, a Chinese uh, a communist a nationalist environment. That is what they see, whether it's on uh, social media or on state television. And uh, that uh, wider mass of the population, I think, is is pretty uh, positive about uh, the regime, nationalistic in its outlook, and pleased with all that Xi Jinping says he's doing to reduce corruption and inequality. Amongst more educated uh, uh, Chinese, there's a great deal more ambivalence because they are seeing meaningful restrictions on uh, their freedom. Uh, and threats to their uh, property rights. Uh, after all, Marx was not wrong about everything, John. Marx said that uh, the growth of the bourgeoisie was always followed by an appetite for property rights, and that led in turn to an appetite for a rule of law, and that's what authoritarian regimes uh, tend not to want to hand over, and that's why bourgeois revolutions happen. Well, China has a bourgeoisie, arguably the biggest in history, produced in the shortest space of time. And uh, when you meet uh, those Chinese who've benefited from the policies of opening up that began with Deng Xiaoping, uh, they've made a lot of money, in many cases, a staggering amount of money. What do they want to protect it? From whom? From the party and its ability to confiscate uh, with a mere accusation of, of corruption or some other malfeasance, the, the, the hard earned riches of the Chinese bourgeoisie. So I think it's important to recognize that for the, the great Chinese middle class, there's a lot to worry about. That's why such a large proportion of them were contemplating emigration, uh, according to survey data from just a few years ago. Well, now that option is much, much harder to, to exercise. Uh, so I, I think it's it's important to recognize how ambivalent the, the Chinese middle class, the educated middle class, is about Xi Jinping. But he can certainly count on the masses, as far as I, as far as we can tell. Uh, and I think when it comes to nationalism, we begin to see that that's the way Xi can keep the middle class on board. I mean, they don't believe in communism. They definitely don't believe in Xi Jinping thought. The masses may believe in it, but the elite does not want to study Xi Jinping thought. But if you press their buttons on nationalism, if you press the Han Chinese nationalist button, you'll get a response from even highly educated Chinese who've spent time in the West. I think that's what Xi Jinping is gambling on to keep the party in power. Well, then finally, can we switch back then to the mindset in the West? You've recently written a book, Doom, The Politics of Catastrophe. Uh, the uh, the Australian uh, uh, newspaper here carried a fascinating story a little while ago about young men seeking vasectomies in record numbers. And you'll think, where on earth is John going with this? Uh, the point was that the, there's such a feeling of doom. The world's finished. Climate change is going to get us. Uh, we're a terrible culture anyway. Look, we're, you know, white supremacists, what have you. But, you know, we're sort of fearful, cowering in a corner, it's all over. There's not going to be a life for me, let alone any children I might bring into the world. Glasgow's coming up. There's been some unbelievable catastrophism in some of the language that's been used. China, as you say, uh, you know, a very interesting conundrum in the middle of all of this because power will matter far more to Beijing, I would have thought, than cleaning up the environment. But your latest book, Doom, uh, catastrophism, it's always been with us. It's not new. But what is it about the West that has seen it now so weakened, so captured by catastrophism, so weakened, I think it is, anyway, by that catastrophism, by that lack of optimism, by that almost energy sapping sort of feeling that there's no point going out there seeing challenges to be overcome. Let's just 
succumb and give way to the challenges, whether they're real or not. What's happened? Well, it's true that we've always been fascinated as a species by the end of the world, and, and most of the great religions have some kind of apocalyptic uh, denouement as part of the package. That's true of Buddhism, it's true of Christianity, it's true of Islam. Uh, even in our secular age, people are still fascinated by the idea of the end of the world. They like movies about it, they like books about it, and of course, when Greta Thunberg shrieks that the end of the world is nigh if we don't immediately cease to consume fossil fuels. There's a there's a ready market for that. She's an absolutely classic child saint predicting uh, the apocalypse. Mill millenarian movements always have an appeal. The point of doom is uh, to argue that it's not the end of the world we have to worry about. It's just disastrous. And they're not even especially huge disasters. Even COVID-19 to date has killed 0.06% of uh, the world's population. Every death is a tragedy, uh, but as a share of the world's population, that doesn't get you into the top 10 of historical disasters, not even close. So I think part of what we suffer from is a loss of perspective. Uh, we are, I think, excessively focused on uh, the dangers arising from climate change. I don't deny these, but I don't think that, that they're the most rapidly acting threats uh, to the species. In fact, climate change implies relatively slow change. Its consequences won't, in fact, be mass death so much as mass migration. But as we learned last year, a pandemic can move a great deal faster uh, than global warming. And uh, we spent much too much time uh, early last year still arguing about climate change uh, and listening to Greta Thunberg rather than noticing uh, the outbreak of a pandemic. So in Doom, I try to suggest that we really should stop worrying about the end of the world and focus on uh, the variety of different things that can cause disasters to strike. Uh, one of them is Cold War II. If we end up in a massive cyber attack, that shuts down our communications, if it turns out that the Chinese and the Russians really have figured out how to do that, uh, we will pretty quickly be focusing on that problem uh, rather than listening to Greta Thunberg. So I think Doom is saying there's a range of different things to worry about. We need to worry about all of them and not just the one that we find most interesting. And interestingly enough, the, the thing that we worry about is probably relatively easy to solve. I suspect technologically we can move uh, away from burning coal and oil relatively quickly as long as we don't shut down cleaner options like gas and nuclear in the belief that only holier than thou renewables will do. So there are actually technological solutions to this problem if we choose to pursue them rationally. In the same way, the thing that everybody worries about, which is, is inequality, is not something that's terribly difficult to solve. If you just provided decent education to the bottom quintile of the population in most countries, the effects would be dramatic. I, I think our problems in the 21st century are actually easier to solve than the problems of the mid 20th century. I mean, then they had to come up with splitting the atom. Then they had to figure out a whole range of vaccines that we've been rather used to, uh, to using and, and, and using rather unreflectively. So my sense is that our problems are not anything like the end of the world. They're actually smaller problems than our grandfathers had to contend with. And we should stop worrying and get on with solving them. And that includes having I, children. I have five, by the way, no vasectomies for me. Well, I have four, so they, <laughs> but, um, and grandchildren now. But, uh, uh, you know, I take your point entirely. It, it's a really important point to make. I mean, I'm, always been involved in agriculture and agricultural policy. For the last 10 years, uh, the, globe has, the globe's farmers have fed, produced enough food and fibre to for, for 10 billion people, well in excess of global population. In Australia, where we're constantly told by the media, and I'm not a climate change denier, and I agree with everything you've said, that we can make progress, that these things can be overcome, but we're constantly catastrophizing and saying it's a disaster. And part of that in Australia is floods and fires are ruining our agricultural sector and so forth. And it has been tough, actually. The managerial side of it's become more difficult, but production has kept rising. Yeah. Technology, innovation, uptake of those things. You talk about education. We now know that um, educational opportunities, just like longevity, have improved out of sight in the developing world over yours and my lifespan. But 
we need to shake ourselves out of this catastrophism that you've been talking about. Neil, you've been really generous with your time. It's a, it's a great privilege to be able to talk to you. And I know that many people, particularly in Australia, will be extremely interested in what you've had to say. John, it's been great as always to catch up with you. Thanks very much for a great conversation and uh, great to see you. And you. Thank you for watching this episode. If you value vital conversations like this one, please like, share, subscribe and join the conversation.